अहम बंत तीसरनेना साहपंचा सीलानी या चामी दुतियांबी अहम बंत तीसरनेना साहपंचा सीलानी या चामी दतियांबी अहम बंत तीसरनेना साहपंचा सीलानी या चामी नमो तस्सा भगवतो आरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धसा नमो तस्सा भगवतो आरहत सम्मा संबुद्धसा नमो तस्सा भगवतो आरहतो 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 समा संबुधासा बुधं सरनं गच्छामि बुधं सरनं गच्छामि धमं सरनं गच्छामि धमं सरनं गच्छामि संघं सरनं गच्छामि संघं सरनं गच्छामि Dutiyampi buddhang saranangga chami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranangga chami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranangga chami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranangga chami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranangga chami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranangga chami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Ti saranagamanang nititang Ama bante Parna tipata viramani sikha Samadhyami Parna tipata viramani sikha Padang samadhyami Adinna dana viramani sikha Padang samadhyami Adinna dana ve ramani sika padang samadhyami. Kami su nichaha chana ve ramani sika padang samadhyami. Kami su micha chara ve ramani sika padang samadhyami. Musa vada ve ramani sika padang samadhyami. Musawadawe Ramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Surami Raya Majapamadatana Ve Ramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Surami Raya Majapamadatana Ve Ramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Imani pancha sikha padani sile na sugating anti sile na bhoga sampada sile na nibuting anti tasma silang sudhaye Sadu, sadu, sadu Sadu, sadu, sadu Sadu, sadu, sadu Sadu, sadu, sadu 149 Maha Salaya Tatnika Sutta, the great sixfold base. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Salati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, Venerable Sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this. Bhikkhus, I shall teach you a discourse on the great sixfold base. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, the bhikkhus replied. The blessed one said this. Bhikkhus, when one does not know and see the eyes it actually is, note 1338, 
when one does not know and see the eye by way of insight knowledge and path knowledge. End note. When one does not know and see forms as they actually are, when one does not know and see eye consciousness as it actually is, when one does not know and see eye contact as it actually is, when one does not know and see as it actually is the feeling felt as pleasant or painful or neither neither painful nor pleasant, that arises with eye contact as condition, then one is inflamed by lust for the eye, for forms, for eye consciousness, for eye contact, for the feeling felt as pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant, that arises with eye contact as condition. When one abides inflamed by lust, fettered, infatuated, contemplating gratification, then the five aggregates affected by clinging are built up for oneself in the future. 1339. That is, the craving that arises and settles on the eye and forms, etc., holds on them with clinging, and this produces comma that can generate a new set of five aggregates in the next existence. And one's craving, which brings renewal of being, is accompanied by delight and lust, and delights in this and that, increases. One's bodily and mental troubles increase. One's bodily and mental torments increase. One's bodily and mental fevers increase. And one experiences bodily and mental suffering. So you can see how the practice of mindfulness applies here. This is a progression. Uh, There is the I. And because of the I, there is forms. or, Or there is the seeing of forms. And with the contact between the eye and forms and the mind, and there arises the feeling. And because of the feeling, there arises the craving. But all of this can be taken as an object of mindful contemplation. So always remember these suttas are not about theory. They're a reminder for us to know how to direct our practice. So it's a way of looking at mindful practice. You can take any of these and break up the chain. And this is what is meant by knowing and seeing as they actually are. It's obviously through the practice of mindfulness. And that's the point of mindfulness. It's not to fix or to change. It's to see and to understand. Because that changes your reactions to things. It prevents you from like likes and dislikes and ignorance and delusion about them. So when, we, when people ask about how to overcome addictions, often asking in a very practical way and for their lives, feel like they're addicted to certain things. This is the way is to break it into the actual experiences and interrupt the feedback loop that makes it an addiction. Or to eight, when one does not know and see the ear as it actually is, When one does not know and see the nose as it actually is, when one does not know and see the tongue as it actually is, when one does not know and see the body as it actually is, when one does not know and see the mind as it actually is, one experiences bodily and mental suffering. Because when one knows and sees the eye as it actually is, Note 1340, when one knows and sees the eye by insight and the path, when one knows and sees forms as they actually are, when one knows and sees eye consciousness as it actually is, when one knows and sees eye contact as it actually is, when one knows and sees as it actually is the feeling felt as pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, that arises with eye contact as condition, then one is not inflamed by lust for the eye, for forms, for eye consciousness, for eye contact, for the feeling felt as pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, that arises with eye contact as condition. When one abides uninflamed by lust, unfettered, uninfatuated, contemplating danger, then the five aggregates affected by clinging are diminished for oneself in the future, 
and one's craving, which brings renewal of being, is accompanied by delight and lust, and delights in this or that, is abandoned. One's bodily and mental troubles are abandoned. One's bodily and mental torments are abandoned. One's bodily and mental fevers are abandoned. And one experiences bodily and mental pleasure. The view of a person such as this is right view. His intention is right intention. His effort is right effort. His mindfulness is right mindfulness. His concentration is right concentration. But his bodily action, his verbal action, and his livelihood have already been well purified earlier. Note 1341 says, The eight factors of the path mentioned here seem to pertain to the preliminary or mundane portion of the path. MT identifies them with the factors possessed by a person at the highest level of insight development, immediately prior to the emergence of the supramundane path. In this stage only, the former five path factors are actively operative. The three factors of the mor- morality group have been purified prior to the undertaking of insight meditation. But when the supramundane path arises, All eight factors occur simultaneously, the three factors of the morality group exercising the function of eradicating the defilements responsible for moral transgression in speech, action, and livelihood. Continued, thus, this noble eightfold path comes to fulfillment in him by development. When he develops the noble eightfold path, The four foundations of mindfulness also come to fulfillment in him by development. The four right kinds of striving also come to fulfillment in him by development. The four bases for spiritual power also come to fulfillment in him by development. The five faculties also come to fulfillment in him by development. The five powers also come to fulfillment in him by development. The seven enlightenment factors also come to fulfillment in him by development. These two things, serenity and insight, occur in him, yoked evenly together. Note 13, 2 says, M.A. says that this refers to the simultaneous arising of serenity and insight in the supramundane path. The former is present under the heading of right concentration, the latter under the heading of right view. He fully understands by direct knowledge those things that should be fully understood by direct knowledge. He abandons by direct knowledge those things that should be abandoned by direct knowledge. He develops by direct knowledge those things that should be developed by direct knowledge. He realizes by direct knowledge, those things that could be realized by direct knowledge. And note 1343 says, These are the four functions exercised by the supramundane path, fully understanding the truth of suffering, abandoning the cause of suffering, realizing the cessation of suffering, and developing the path that leads to the end of suffering. And what things should be fully understood by direct knowledge? The answer to that is the five aggregates affected by clinging, that is, the material form aggregate affected by clinging, the feeling aggregate affected by clinging, the perception aggregate affected by clinging, the formations aggregate affected by clinging, the consciousness aggregate affected by clinging. These are the things that should be fully understood by direct knowledge. And what things should be abandoned by direct knowledge? Ignorance and craving for being. These are the things that should be abandoned by direct knowledge. And what things should be developed by direct knowledge? Serenity and insight. Note 1344. Here serenity and insight represent the entire noble eightfold path. These are the things that should be developed by direct knowledge. 
And what things should be realized by direct knowledge, true knowledge and deliverance? Note 1345. MA identifies true knowledge with the knowledge of the path of arahantship, deliverance with the fruit of arahantship. Here these take the place usually reserved for Nibbana, the true cessation of suffering. These are the things that should be realized by direct knowledge. When one knows and sees the ear as it actually is, these are the things that should be realized by the direct knowledge. Note 1346. This passage and each of the following passages repeat the entire text 9 to 11, the only change being in the sense faculty and object. When one knows and sees the nose as it actually is, these are the things that should be realized by direct knowledge. When one knows and sees the tongue as it actually is, these are the things that should be realized by direct knowledge. When one knows and sees the body as it actually is, these are the things that should be realized by direct knowledge. When one knows and sees the mind as it actually is, these are the things that should be realized by direct knowledge. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Is there a, an advice of how not engaging with uh, with other people or to be more recluse or is there in the texts such an advice for for us advice to stay by yourself yeah there's lots of that not only from the point of view of a relationship but of the how how much to interact with other people well, you can't put a rule on such things you have to have mindfulness in the situation there's nobody who's going to walk you through your life and tell you what to do at every every turn there's only ways of learning how to do it yourself yeah that's true thank you a couple of interesting things about how this sutta adapts the four noble truths first of all there's a reminder that the five aggregates are the truth of suffering um, the first noble truth is really just a enumeration of experience or a pointing out how experience is not worth clinging to, is impermanent suffering, is impermanent and uncontrollable and unsatisfying, it, it, the things that we cling to. But the second uh, noble truth here, the next, second noble truth is always described as craving. But uh, here he reminds us that the importance of ignorance. So ignorance is also considered to be the cause of suffering, which, I mean, it's not unsurprising. It's just, it's often uh, missed because we, we've read that the cause of suffering is tanha, right? But you can't have tanha without ignorance. And the, the value of that statement is, it reminds us of the importance, again, of mindfulness. And again, what is mindfulness for? Not to fix, not to remove craving or or suppress it or avoid it or something but to create the understanding that prevents craving in the first place you crave things that are perceived as as valuable as satisfying and that's ignorance so the only reason for the craving is ignorance it's kind of the difference between samatha and vipassana in terms of meditation practices here in this sutta samatha and vipassana are, are mentioned, but they are mentioned, of course, as qualities of mind, not as meditation practices. So again, there are certain meditation practices that don't lead to both qualities. And so those are the kind that would suppress greed, would suppress anger, but wouldn't eradicate it because they don't remove the ignorance, the delusion. Mindfulness cuts to the root and doesn't, in fact, attack greed and anger directly but more directly attacks the delusion and the ignorance through seeing clearly, because then, of course, greed and anger can't arise. And this is the reason he's more talking about craving than ignorance, because uh, you can't really see ignorance, or 
be aware of it. Well, it's implied because the Four Noble Truths are our wisdom. So it's seeing that craving, well, it's not even seeing, it's seeing the First Noble Truth is the eradicate is the eradication of ignorance and so when you see the the truth of craving or or parinyaya when you fully understand it then there is the i mean he basically says it he just doesn't use the word ignorance normally he says when you know fully the truth of suffering then there's the abandoning of cause of suffering where he says, where the translation says true knowledge, the, the Pali is actually simpler. It just says knowledge. There's no tr- implication of true. Well, not in the, not in the, in the wording. I, it just is literally knowledge, vijja. And deliverance is just freedom, knowledge and freedom. So he's okay to translate it this way, I guess, because that's what it implies. It's not any knowledge. It's the best kind of, and the, the most important kind of knowledge. But just so you don't, wonder because true does have some connotations that it shouldn't be there true is probably not the best adjective in fact i would just translate it as knowledge and freedom but just a note that that's actually what it says also direct knowledge i'm not sure it's okay i mean it's not a bad translation but i'm not sure if the implication is something a bit different because it's abhinya abhinya which abhi means kind of higher or special or powerful. I'm not sure that abhi means direct. Maybe. I mean, it's a good. It's a good phrase. Direct knowledge as opposed to intellectual theoretical knowledge. Is it the knowledge that one gains, but by the direct experience? The knowledge gained by following the path. One single translation says vishishta jnana, excellent jnana. Yeah. It's uh, it's not really translatable as direct, I don't think. It's a, it's a good phrase again, but maybe worth remembering or no, knowing that the actual Pali says abhinya, which is a bit unique. I mean, abhinya is often used to refer to what, the six abhinya, right? Used to refer to magical powers, super, supernatural powers. But the, I think the implication here is just a simple higher knowledge, higher than ordinary knowledge so we're not talking about the way we use the word to know like i know this i know that it's a reminder that those kinds of knowledges aren't real knowledge so when he enumerates all uh, all this uh, when the noble eightfold path comes to fulfillment in him by development so it's in the paragraph 10 you mentioned the four bases for spiritual power also come to fulfillment in him. Is this the Idipadas? Are these the Idipadas? And is this also related to Abhinya or not? Yeah, it, this whole list, there is the 37 Bodhipakya Dhamma. There's 37 yes. if you count them. Right? And yeah, the Idipada are part of that. Yeah, most of, most of them I recognize because you gave many, many, or at least I heard your talks on this, these uh, several times. I just don't know what this could be, the four bases for spiritual power. And I'm assuming are the Idipadas, I don't know. Yeah, the list, is, list uh, uh, shown here is... Uh... Uh, Satra Samakpadana and then uh, Satra Itipada Panchendri. Oh, sa- Satra is the four? Yeah. He's speaking singular, I think. <laughs> Sorry. Chattara, <laughs> Chattura. I mean, you are the Pali. Satipadana, the Samapadana, the Indipada, the Indriya. The Bala and the Bojanga. So how many? Let's count them. We have four, eight, twelve, seventeen, twenty-two, twenty-nine. So twenty-nine. Why are we missing eight? Yeah. What, what are the eight we could be missing? Any guesses? Oh, you already know the answer, Vante. 
Oh yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> oh, can we can we recap what we have? Oh, read about? read the paragraph. It's actually in the paragraph. It's it is there. It isn't missing. No bullet for path. I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's also a kind of a unique. You don't really hear hear the thirty seven factors. I don't think um, described this way. Maybe, but I, I wasn't aware of it like this. Where he says that when you develop the eightfold noble path, then there's the other, the rest of the thirty seven are there. So it says all these are in fulfillment in him by development. Could this be only a moment where? Um, all these become to fulfillment. Is yeah. this just the I mean, moment? I mean, it's like kind of like saying that when a race car passes the finish line, all the wheels and the doors and the engine and everything also crosses the finish line at the same time. I mean, it's a, it's a mm -hmm. weak, weak analogy, but it's it's important to understand it. It is kind of like that in the sense that these are not separate things. It's more like all of these. Things are things to be taught as taking part in the activity. Just like when a mechanic goes to school, they have to learn about all the parts. But the activity is just driving the car and all the parts, they work together. And in fact, like the Eightfold Noble Path contains, of course, all of the, the rest of the, the parts. And you could make a... a a diagram showing connecting each of the pieces with each other would be quite complicated, right? Like if you take the five faculties, for example, you've got sati, or so you've got sadha, you've got vidya, and you've got sati, samadhi, and panya. So where does vidya fit in? Sadha is actually the only one that's not directly in the Eightfold Noble Path. It's interesting. I have I have this ongoing argument with some Sri Lankan uh, Buddhists in America, who uh, and it's funny how ongoing it is. Every time I see them, they hint at it because I deny the importance of sadha, and it's very suspicious to, to do so because it sounds very Western. Oh, this is just Western people who don't understand Buddhism saying that sadha is not so important. But I didn't really say that it's not so important, just that it's not necessary to have sadha before you practice meditation. And in yes. fact, the best kind of sadha should come from meditation. But they were saying that before you even practice, you need to have sadha. I mean, is the yes, okay, you need to have enough sadha to actually undertake the practice uh, in any meaningful way, but it's not really sadha. You, you need to be willing to try it, in fact. I mean, ehi pasiko, you have to come and see. The... Anyway, but um, I think it's a fairly, it's wrong view, and it's it's dangerous to say that it, it, it can lead to making excuses. Oh, no, I'm not going to practice meditation right now because I'm going to work on my sadha first, something like that. But in fact, sadha is not, uh, I, I point this out because it's not all that central. Like, find me a place where it is described as central. It's not really. I can't think of any examples where the Buddha puts it front and center. It can, it can lead to blind faith. But as long as, as far as meditation goes, uh, sadha, like the opposite of uh, the fifth hindrance. So as long as yeah. the fifth hindrance... Yeah, I mean, obviously, sadha is, 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 is a huge driving factor. And if you don't have... It, you're just it's gonna your practice is gonna be weak and when you have doubt of course doubt is the worst it's the worst of the five hindrances so absolutely but it's more of like something that develops it's not something you need in advance and to emphasize it is I think just unhelpful because it, it suppose you're doubting right and then someone tells you oh you need sadha then you feel like oh no I can't do this because I have doubt but look at the Kalama Sutta, right? It's really what the Kalama Sutta should be used for, should be referred to for. You don't worry about it. Doubt is doubt is is reasonable. The Buddha said, of course you're doubting. You're doubting about two different people saying different things. So try and learn for yourself. Because when you know for yourself, then you won't have any doubt. After you know for yourself, or as you learn for yourself, you're 
confidence will improve. Don't worry about the fact that you're doubting. It's not, it doesn't mean that what you're doing is wrong. It doesn't mean that you're wrong. It just means you have to look harder and get rid of that doubt. I think the idea was that study, they were emphasizing especially study, that study, it was important that you do a lot of study because study will give you confidence. I mean, I think it will because if you read the Buddhist teaching, it's quite powerful and quite impressive and vast and deep and so on. I think that's what they felt. It's a personal thing for them, like these scholars study and then they really appreciate the Buddhist teaching. And they, they and it's maybe a little bit of ego because they have a deeper knowledge than most people. So they look at these people who don't really have much faith in Buddhism, but they say, huh, it's because you haven't studied like I've studied. So they have overconfidence. They're very, very confident because look at me, I know much more than you. That kind of thing. But it's... Uh, it's funny because they, a couple of them visited me recently and they mentioned it as well. Like a, a, pretending that we hadn't had this long conversation. Oh, uh, confidence is important, right? Something like that. I can't remember. I was like, are you bringing this up again? Don't think I've forgotten <laughs> we had this conversation many times. It's not that it's not important. It's just uh, not front and center. And it's not something you have to overemphasize. But it is worth remarking that it's not in the Eightfold Noble Path directly. You can't make a correlation. But what I was getting at is that you can with most of these, like the four Idipada is just right right effort, right? Oh, sorry, the four Samapadana is right effort. Yeah. With the Idipada, a little harder. They don't all fit, I guess. Right uh, the reason they this. like to put it that first is because we always start by taking uh, the refuge. So that is... Basically, Sadha, we take refuge in the triple gem and then we proceed to uh, whatever the rest. Yeah. yeah, but that's what we do. I mean, look at how it works in the suttas. It's not really like that. People take refuge after after they gain confidence. And how did they gain confidence? Through listening. And that that might be why they think you have to study. Because if you study, then you'll gain confidence. But it's also through practice. You can't really take that away from the super, take that from the stories because these are exceptional people. I guess how they see it is if you see if you come to someone who has never heard of Buddhism, you give them a talk and then they 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 like it. They say, "Wow, they're impressed by it," and that leads to confidence, which leads them to practice. So it, it's not wrong to say that you need confidence. I think it's just again wrong to overemphasize it because. Obviously, all you need is the confidence to be willing to try it, which isn't really confidence. It's just lack of aversion or it's a desire in a sense, desire to try it. Like if I say, oh, this practice leads to the end of suffering, you don't have to believe me. It's not confidence. You just have to want to be free from suffering and say, okay, I'm willing to try it without any confidence or knowledge that it's going to work, right? You don't need the confidence that it's going to work. You just try it. Say, oh, I want that. And so you say, okay, let's try it. And then when you try it, then the confidence arrives. But what if uh, that person thinks, oh, person is doesn't know what he's talking about. He's crazy. He's just, uh, just trying to trick me or something. Like a Christian who is a devout uh, like believer of the God wouldn't even try it because he sees a monk wearing a robe. <laughs> completely turned off well that's prejudice um but there's also the idea of doubt in there right you have doubt about someone because of well that's not really doubt i don't think what you're describing it's more prejudice but, but i don't know if i remember incorrectly but i remember that uh, once you said that ajahn tong said that if somebody has doubt there is something that he cannot help with. No, it's not okay. true. I mean, doubt is doubt is is dangerous. It's what leads you on the wrong path. He used to say that a lot. Doubt is what leads you to get lost. Long tang, long tang kai. Ante, Luis asks in the chat. I wanted to ask what Dante thought. Chaku sampasa pachaya 
eye contact meant in the sutta. Vajaya is, is not, Vajaya is a separate word. Vajaya means dependent on. But yeah. Chakku Sampasa, Chakku Sampasa is the contact with the mind and the eye. It's just a description of, of the trigger of experience. Like, why does experience happen? You describe that by saying, well, there's contact between the eye and the light and the mind. So without light, there is no seeing. Without the eye, there is no seeing. And without the mind, there is no seeing. But light is a bit deceptive because you can have a mental vision. With your eyes closed, you can have the experience of seeing in the mind. Now, that is still seeing. But uh, the, the, the description is that there is the receiving of the image, there is the image, and then there is the mind that is aware of it. But there, uh, there is no eye consciousness present but there, Bhante. That's, uh, that's just mind object, right? So there is no, it's not necessary yeah. to have an outside form. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, sorry, the, that, that's, that was wrong. The Chakku Sampasa is specifically referring the to the eye. physical eye. Yeah. Yes. But it's still, it's funny, I think scientists would still say that the, the experience doesn't take place at the eye. Actually, it takes place in the brain. I'm not sure what Buddhism says about that. But if they study the brain, they can see that it's the same sort of thing happening. I don't think it's contradictory. It's just, it's obviously, it's more complicated. The mental imagery is, is simple, whereas the physical imagery is requires the eye first, still requires the eye. Yes. Why is there the pachaya? I, I was also confused about that. Where did you well, see this uh, board, Luis? Well, Maybe it's in a, it, in a passage talking about feeling that arises dependent on contact. Oh, dependent on. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Weidai dang sukangwa dukangwa adukama sukangwa. Pleasant, painful, or neither pleasant nor painful feelings that arise dependent on contact with the eye. I just was. Uh, I wa I wanted to know why the final number is thirty-seven regarding the factors because. Uh, there is virya sati samadhi that doubles up in the factor uh, the seven factor of enlightenment and the noble eightfold path so i was asking myself if those is to be regarded in a different way or they are the same they are the same mm. so again this is yeah i mean it's actually more it has to be you have to understand that these are not separate entities like we're not actually 37 different things it's just, this is knowledge. These are ways of talking about specific topics. Like if you were to give a lecture on effort, you could talk about the four, the Mahapadana is a way of describing effort. There are other ways of describing effort as well. The same goes with each quality. Which is, I mean, the Abhidhamma is very valuable, appreciated it for, for that, because it talks about um, the actual realities and it doesn't have duplicates in the same way the, the suttas are much more uh pedagogical they're they're for the for teaching purposes they're not meant to be technical references so let's say that uh, every factor have his own uh, qualities but then in the reality they arise and cease um, altogether or well, not altogether, well, but it's not even just altogether. It's it's more than that. It's that they are talking about the same things. All this is is the Buddha bringing together different sets of things that he talked about. But those there's a lot of overlap in among those sets. It's pointing out that all these things that I've taught as being good, all of them arise at this time. You, you accomplish all of these things at once. Ajahn Tong gave you. a talk that was, uh, he, he wrote it out, I think, and and uh, recorded this talk that became fairly standard, where he went through the 37 uh, Bodhipakya Dhamma and described how they arise every time you say to yourself, stepping right, stepping left, or when you watch the stomach rising and falling, he described how they arise 
at that moment. I think that was my follow-up question as well about these lists. Uh, that um, like it it becomes fulfilled in a moment, right? But then, f for example, if you're not an arahant, it will uh, fall back again, right? And and it will also become fulfilled again in some moments, and then fall back again. <laughs> That's yeah. how I. I, mean, I think. I think, I think the it. use of the use of pointing it out is that it's uh, again everything arises. All, all good things come. It's a way of providing reassurance and confidence that uh, you're not missing anything. In a sense, reminding us how simple it is that you don't have to go around developing one or another quality. A lot of people, when they first learn about the Eightfold Noble Path, they, I mean, to some extent, it can be, especially with the three parts, take it as parts, right? You can practice one thing at a time, but it's missing the point to take that as an actual standard Buddhist practice. That standard Buddhist practice involves the cultivation of all eight parts simultaneously through simple practices of mindfulness. At the Noble Eightfold Path, we can cultivate it as uh, the preliminary path, like avoiding, uh, like, for example, uh, some uh, Ajiv, uh, avoiding uh, wrong livelihood and all. Yeah, for sure, yes. especially with those three. But uh, nonetheless, it's all accomplished and accomplished better in the practice of mindfulness. Like when you're walking back and forth, you have right livelihood, right action, right speech. When you're sitting still and watching the stomach rising and falling, you have them all in a much better way than could be navigated in conventional life. But but that's confusing, and so that's why the Buddha says here, it's quite notable that he says here, um, which he doesn't always say, he says that uh, you've actually developed all three of the sila group previously. Because it is kind of kind of silly to say that when you're walking back and forth, you have, for example, right livelihood, because it doesn't concern livelihood at all. But technically... The, book, the texts are, are pretty clear that technically you have right livelihood at that moment. And of course, you have right livelihood, but technically you're kind of developing right livelihood, even though it's kind of silly to say, practically speaking, it's nothing to do with livelihood. And so the Buddha here recognizes that and says, yeah, you've developed those previously. I mean, I guess one way of, of, explain, of explaining that is it's not that you've developed them previously, is that by the very fact that you're doing mindful meditation, these just don't come into question. You've you've purified them by the very fact that you're doing them. You don't. There's no cultivation of them because they're already fulfilled. I have a. I had. A, I didn't understand uh, the thing when I was going through uh, some Vitanika at one point. To it's mentioned that uh, this the cessation of consciousness uh, leads to the cessation of name and form. I would, I would, I would love if uh, Vante could elaborate this thing for me. That's part of just part. Well, that particular is referring to the non-arising of of the rebirth consciousness. So, at the moment of death for an arahant, there is no rebirth, and as a result, there is no nama rupa. Now, nama rupa probably isn't best translated as name and form, but body and mind. Body and mind, meaning uh, the uh, aspects of experience, like chaku sampasa pache, so chaku sampasa, or chaku and chaku vinyana, meaning um, existence. Nama rupa is just a way of describing existence in a Buddhist way. So it doesn't mean a being, although that's kind of what it, how it's used. It's used to describe a being, but it it actually literally just means experiences. Experiences of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, and thinking. So those won't arise without vinyana. And particularly there, without the vinyana, meaning without rebirth, there will not be nama rupa. Patisandhi, patisandhi vinyana, I think is what it's referring to. Bante, I've got a question. It seems like 
um, effort is mentioned quite a lot of times um, in the 37, uh, I counted maybe nine or eight or nine, I'm not too sure. Um, mm-hmm. On a practical level, I guess I'm, 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 I'm sort of on the surface also interpreting effort as putting effort to do the practice. And on a practical level, when like I've got an injury and walking meditation is not practical, I find it quite difficult to stir up energy or you know the will to practice because after sitting then it's then what next because it's it becomes sort of dull and not as not as easy I guess as when I could stand up and do walking again. Well, that, that, there's uh, there's no getting around it. You've got to develop wholesome qualities. We're all lacking in in various qualities, and that prevents us from succeeding. So I have no answer for how to uh, make it suddenly go away. But the, the gradual answer is you know, associate with good people, cultivate good deeds, and cultivate mindfulness overall. If you're mindful, you can deal with a lot of things. I mean, oftentimes, it's just that we're looking at it wrong. You look at it as a problem or an obstacle. Give it a life of its own. In fact, if you were to take it as an object of mindfulness, pinpoint what it is that you're actually experiencing, describe as uh, an inability or an incapacity, then it disappears and uh, your attachment to it fades away. And so you're able to move on. I guess it's not that important, right? Like in what position you are, uh, if you if the mind can be pure and the mind can uh, basically do formal practice. Yeah, but it's easier to be lazy. It's easier to make excuses for yourself when you have when you get things getting in the way. Like oh, the, like the Buddha said it. Like oh, it's too hot. It's too cold. I'm too hungry. I'm too full. That sort of thing. If you can't walk, if you can't walk, you, you can't walk. Well, the proximate cause of uh, both Dina and Vidya is said to be Ioniso Manasekara, so just have to be mindful. Pay better attention. So that did, does this answer mm-hmm. your question? Um, I mean, of course it does, right? Um, but it's, it's, I don't like it. <laughs> but yes, it, it, uh, um, yeah, it has to be it, resigned I mean, it does. to the fact I mean, that there's no, there's no quick answer, there's no easy solution. Yeah. It can take a lifetime or lifetimes to really become energetic, for example, or confident or wise. Association I mean, with good to... people and good deeds, those are two important auxiliary practices. That make practice easier. Yeah, I, I I do notice that though that when I'm around energetic people, even with the you know, even when there's obstacles, like you know, I've got a sore knee, for instance, there somehow there is a bit of zeal that you find some way to do something. It might not be formal practice, but you're you know helping out with some activity or something. So I, I like what you said about um, not necessarily being quote unquote formal practice, but there's uh, there's a bit of being dynamic about how sort of practicing <laughs> practicing being a better person. Uh-huh. Yeah, I I had a I sprained my ankle uh, not long ago, like a month ago. And it was like just so slow to recover from that. But uh, yeah, you have to be aware of your aversion to the pain or things like that as well. But I see that you're so, um, that you can see that you're averse, basically. Uh, yes, yeah, of course. It's like a, it's like this like self-pity or... It's like also yeah, desire this, for it to go away. Yeah. 
So I guess to I'm, see I'm that here. clearly and eventually you get bored with that. Uh, Bante, Luis asks in the chat, can we note while speaking as well? I'm not going to stop you. I guess it depends on your mind. How fast is your mind? Are you able to catch that that fast? No, I feel like there is a difference. No, like uh, can you note or are you mindful? It has to be note. both the, together. The thing we don't for me. really understand about speaking is that you generally form the mental activity before speech occurs. The speech is physical, yeah. and it's a result of the activity. So during the physical activity, there's a lot to know. You can know the feeling of the lips, you can know the sound of your own voice. The tongue. You can note you can note emotions. Yeah, actually I was I was looking at that like the I mean, how is the basically the the mouth doing what it it, it has to do without constantly thinking about what, what I'm going to say or something weird. Well, when, when an arahant speaks, uh, he is mindful. So it is probably possible. It's just that we can't practice it that way. It is said that uh, when the Buddha himself speaks, uh, he enters the jhanas between each either sentence or words. I don't remember exactly. So depends on how powerful your mind is. Bante, wouldn't wouldn't thinking for an arahant be just a functional, wholesome chittas? Functional and wholesome are distinct. You can't say something is functional. Oh, then just functional, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's part of the sensual uh, chittas. Still, Sobana, yeah. I think, is it? Yeah, Sobana. So it's beautiful, beautiful, but not wholesome. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They have similar cheta seekers. Doesn't make it wholesome karma. So it's more correct to say just uh, functional and that's it, right? Yeah, technically you can't say functional wholesome. Okay. Because if you say all wholesome, it, it already implies that you're generating karma, wholesome karma, right. which is not true. All right. Right. I mean, it's kind of a problem with. Uh, the word because wholesome doesn't really imply that that kind of does i guess wholesome does imply something productive about it but functional arahant chittas are not productive for the arahant now of course arahants are highly productive for other people and for the world and also for themselves physically like the funny thing is that arahants all the things they do make their life better for themselves, right? People love them, people honor them and support them because of everything they do. So they are very productive, but not mentally. That's the point, is mentally they're not productive. They don't change anything about mind or make the Arahant's uh, mind more pure because it's already perfectly pure. During lay life, it's very much possible if you go to work, etc., uh, to be free from greed, anger, and delusion, to do activities that don't uh, require that these states and even arahants go for alms and engage in social activities like discussing with other uh, recluses in the suttas where they discuss with recluses from other sects so why would it be impossible for an arahant to live in lay life uh, so and where is the line i think it relates mostly to their ability to support themselves an arahant wouldn't go out of their way to find food, so they would just waste away. An arahant, as a lay, an arahant can be a lay person. They just would starve themselves. They wouldn't engage in activities. It's. I think it's a little more magical um, as well because it would just be totally incongruous with the, with the world around them. Monastic life is enough of a protection that they would be able to survive and that they wouldn't be un const under constant attack from other people and from expectations around them and just from the world in general. 
Hey, they said that lay life is too weak to have an around, sustain an around. It's not suitable, that kind of So either they go to a forest or they get ordained if, if a lay person became an around, or they became, become Paranipana, added Paranipana. Perhaps that's why the Arahants cannot live the lay life, just because it's, it's too difficult for them to live purely and and then just being surrounded by the the yeah i mean that's a good observation that, that that's a part of it for sure that's sort of what i was getting at is how incongruous it is and how it leads to stress and disharmony for the other people but if you simply look at uh, somebody that meditate uh, not just be, not because we are special, but uh, you cannot get involved with uh, maybe what we you was doing before or with people that you was engaging before. So I think that it is the same reason for them. I think uh, it's more about like if you're an arahant, I guess even if you are in the in the sangha or wherever you are, like uh, their mind is so secluded, right? It's not really coming out. Much? No interest? But then I would also think that they would have no problem with dealing with these kinds of things because they know it's part of their past karma, for example. They just know that's how it is. Yeah, it's still tiresome. It's, too, it's draining, sapping of energy. So they, they would incline away from it. That uh, you can't, as a layperson, you just don't have any means of escape or means of uh, escape, I guess, for lack of a better word. Not that they're trying to escape. It's, escape is a bit of a strong word, but they just incline away from it and there's no way to get away from it. And there's no real way to interact meaningfully as a layperson. So, I, I mean, there's not really a good explanation or a clear explanation in the text about why they would pass away. It's just simply that. It's not able to support them. So figure you figure out why that is. So basically what keeps us in lay life is craving. Otherwise we would be all either going to the forest to become hermits or becoming monks. What keeps us in lay life is our craving. So once there's no craving, there's nothing keeping us from leaving lay life. Well, sort of. I mean, except the fact that the Ordination's not easy. It's not quite that because, like for an arahant, sometimes they can't ordain, even though they're an arahant. It's what's keeping them in lay life, not their craving. Yeah, in that case, if if uh, if it's a Pacheka Buddha, he would go to the forest. Uh, if it's an arahant, he would attend Paranipana. So even a Pacheka Buddha would uh, avoid society, right? Yeah. Yeah, but what what are the cases when uh, an arahant is not able to ordain? Well, there can be could could be factors like debt, uh, disability. Can it be uh, not getting permission from parents? Yep. Yeah, I would I would be willing to go out on a limb and, and that the seven days is perhaps just a simplification. And that uh, it's, it's just a way of saying that it's very difficult for an arahant to live as a lay person. Rather than have to have to examine this and think too much about exactly why it is that they they die, uh, it may not always be exactly the case. This reality is unpredictable and complicated. And the text may sometimes be a little bit over oversimplifying or oversimplistic and shouldn't always ta be taken exactly literally, especially when they're commentarial texts that say that. Like there's an example of, I think it is in the suttas, where the Buddha says for this one individual, either she ordains or she goes into Parini. But it's only for her. And it could be, or it would be because the Buddha saw what happened, what the potential was for her. And so it may not be exactly the same for everyone. So it is a good good example of how that is often the case or is 
likely to be the case. Is it is it part of um, the path basically that how your practice progresses, you become more and more and more disinclined to engaging in anything with anyone? Maybe not universally. Uh, I think it's more that you become more more aware of the futility of engaging much of the time when there is reason to to engage you're fully intent on engaging but only when it, there is reason and value yeah, like for example the story of uh, Dhammadina uh, her husband when he became anagami he stopped showing affection to her, stopped uh, interacting with her much. So she suspected that maybe he's having another affair. So She became very distraught. He didn't want to say anything, but she was becoming completely, she was going crazy, unable to process his change, unable to comprehend it. To recognize that somebody just became on our hand, the persons around them, should maybe also be our hands. I mean, maybe um, there, being around other people, those other people won't recognize the the change. What what this this means? Yeah, even an arahant might not recognize it. An arahant won't recognize it about themselves or about the uh, another. About another. Oh, my question is about uh, parinibbana. Mm-hmm. Like, like it seems kind of scary. Like it's like an anesthesia or something. Like when I went to a hospital and uh, I had anesthesia, it was like I blinked and it was two hours later. And there was like nothing in between, like no t- passage of time or anything. Is that something that's similar or is that like it's just I don't know completely like different well, things can't be scary you can only be scared so when you're scared you should not be afraid afraid Parinibbana is just the result I mean, it's not something to be concerned with whatever it is it's what a person who's perfectly wise uh, attains so it's not something you have to worry about because, of course, whatever comes from being perfectly wise is obviously what we want. Your inability to appreciate it now is, is reasonable because you're really not perfectly wise. Well, obviously not if you have doubts about it, but uh, rather than look at it in terms of trying to understand it, try to gain understanding. And then whatever comes will be what a wise person with understanding attains. There's no trap. You're never going to be trapped into accidentally attaining something. All you're asked in Buddhism is to gain understanding. And there can be no doubt about doubt in regards to that because based on understanding, you yourself have the understanding. You don't have any reason to, or any potential for doubt or fear. It's worth noting, right, that uh, whatever one imagines about Paranibbana, that's just an imagination. It's not the actual real thing, which, uh, I mean, Nibbana is a reality that you can experience. So imagination, yeah, it can be scary and whatnot, but it's because it's not real. Kind of. I mean, it's also just not helpful to think about such things. The only way yeah. you could ever appreciate Parinibbana is if you're an arahant. Like when a child thinks about what it would be like to to run a company, I don't know, uh, that, that they're not able to appreciate it. Like, Or I remember when uh, when we were young, my youngest brother, someone gave him a $5 bill or something. And he rejected it. He said, no, no, this isn't real money. Give me a coin. I mean, it was only a few years old, I think, so he didn't quite say it like that, but he just like handed it back. They said, here's money. He just handed it back. He said, I want a, a dollar coin or something like that, because he just didn't understand it. So 
we have no capacity to appreciate our Nibbana. Uh, it's not helpful to think about it or to try and wrestle with it. What you should be wrestling with it is the fear and the doubt because those are very real things and they're very pressing and pertinent and dangerous. And it all logically leads to, or not logically, it all inevitably leads in one direction, but it leads there to wisdom. You should never have any reason to fear or doubt because your focus should always be on understanding. And there can never be any any wrongness about understanding. The funny thing is about this is that we don't know. <laughs> How can we answer your question? I, I mean, I wouldn't be able to answer your question, you know. <laughs> How is a parinibbana? Uh, even even from my part, it would be just uh, speculation and imagination as well. Um, so, Bhante, what makes doubt dangerous? Doubt is what makes you take the wrong path without without any good knowledge. You just pick. A, you make a decision. Like it's it's what causes people to stop practicing, to run away, to leave, to. Um, to pick a, even a different religion. Doubt means lack of clarity, lack of any kind of knowledge about what's right and wrong. We wrestle with, we have, people often ask questions about what decision they should make, and that's directly caused by doubt. If they didn't have doubt, they wouldn't have to ask the question. And people who are wrestling with these questions then have to make decisions, and they make decisions usually by arbitrary means. Or by momentary, in this moment, I have a gut feeling that I like this decision, but there's no knowledge, there's no wisdom about it. Panta, is it dangerous to make a decision for that person who is in doubt and cannot make a decision, for example? What do you mean? Like you would decide for them? Oh, no. You shouldn't ever decide for people. That's why it's often not great to give people answers to such specific questions rather help them cultivate mindfulness but what deciding for them will solve their doubt i mean it may solve their doubt in that moment but it doesn't remove the potential for doubt so the potential for doubt is because of their ignorance or their their inability to see things clearly you're not helping them to see I mean, sometimes if you if you see if you give someone an answer, it if they're if they have the capacity to make the connections, then it can help lead them in the right direction. You give people an example of what's right behavior, then they know what it's like. The right decisions, then they know what right decisions look like, and they can make the connections and say, "Oh yes," and it can help send them in the right direction. But that's only if they have mindfulness already. If they're, but most importantly, they have to develop mindfulness on their own. Sorry, Bante, I think I misunderstood you. So uh, you say um, you shouldn't decide at all for another person when they are, yeah. Well, n mostly you shouldn't. I mean, there is room for suggestions that help guide people to know how to make decisions because that can help them appreciate the ways in which we make right decisions, but yeah, mostly not. If you make decisions for people, uh, you you can make them complacent mm -hmm. and reliant, yeah. dependent. You have to show people why they're unable to make the decision in the first place. Oftentimes, it's just because they're not being very mindful, and often it's often the question isn't even the most important thing. Which decision they choose isn't the most important thing, and the reason why they're Asking the questions in the first place is lack of mindfulness. We ask questions, should I do this, should I do that? Not realizing that that's not the most important question. I was wondering, like, if in life, like, you're a very indecisive person, is that because they have a very bad, like, general mindfulness or, or something, some other missing faculty that they should develop? I mean, it's generally lacking as an individual, but that's not a criticism. We're all lacking, right? That's why we practice. But yeah, it's certainly a sign of, of lacking. Certainly a sign that they need to develop more mindfulness. Indecisive is, I mean, technically not always a bad thing. An arahant might be indecisive in the sense that they don't have enough knowledge to make a decision on a topic. 
and so they may not decide something. But that's that's a good point because what's important is not that they're able to make decisions, it's that they have lack of doubt, lack of worry, lack of uncertainty. I mean, yeah, the word uncertainty is also ambiguous, but they aren't certain. They don't if they don't know the right answer, they just don't make the decision. They're not concerned about that. It doesn't lead to agitation or worry or stress which is always going to be more important than making the right decision. Your quality of mind, even if you're unable to make a decision. It's okay to say, I don't know, and acknowledge that you don't know enough to make a decision. It's far more important as how that how that affects you, and mentally how that affects you. Whether you're worried about that or scared of making the wrong decision, all of those things are more important. Would that be related to conceit, that the person still has conceit if they're, if um, they can't say, I don't know, without um, being perturbed by that? For sure, yeah. Good point. It's a good problem with, with conceit. Prevents you from acknowledging your shortcomings. It can also prevent you from acknowledging your strength. I mean... An enlightened being becomes more confident and more confident, right? Like the Sotapanna or Sakadagami, they become more confident. <clears throat> That's. Uh, well, it, it is a bit different than confident. Um, I mean, I hesitate because yes, but the confidence doesn't even seem like confidence. It's more matter of fact. Like very confident people, you can feel their the attachment that they have with their confidence, the greed, the pride, the conceit, that their mm-hmm. an arahant's confidence does, just feels feels powerful, like a powerful knowledge. If you really pay attention, they don't seem confident, they just seem knowledgeable and aware and wise. So it's not like confident, as we think of a confident person, Confident people are not that impressive. They're just very attached to their confidence. There's greed. There's overestimation usually. And it leads to problems because they are caught off guard when things are not the way they think they are. And they're unable to deal based on their overconfidence. If it feels if it feels confident, if it looks confident or seems confident, it's usually overconfidence. For Narahant, you could say they're supremely confident, but it's not really a very good way of describing it. They just know. Yeah, there are two types of vichikicca. One is called uh, Nivarna vichikicca, and the other one is uh, Anivarna vichikicca. And the Nivarna vichikicca, there are like eight types of vichikicca, including doubt in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and doubt in the uh, Sikha, and... Uh, Doubting about whether you existed in the past or things like that. So there's a list there. Anivarna Vichikicha means doubting about things that you do not know. Not how it deceives you about things you do not know. Um, I have a question about right view. Um, in one of the suttas, um, the Buddha says that if we see the world with right view, then we won't, and we see uh, arising, we won't have a notion of non-existence. And if we truly see the world with right uh, understanding, and we understand cessation, we won't have a notion of uh, existence. Um, so, uh, what does the what is the Buddha trying to make us see in the world? Like, how are we supposed to see the world based on this? Like, without existence or non-existence? I think you have to give the reference. I don't think that's uh-huh. a very good translation. Maybe it is, but... Um, I mean, it doesn't change what the Buddha is trying to explain. Or that the Buddha teach teaching is trying to have us see that uh, reality is arising and ceasing. When you see that, then you see impermanent suffering and non-self and the echo. Yeah, it's a um, bit uh, harder to understand in English, but uh, existence means the idea that something is concrete, 
like an entity. The, 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 it's, it's related to the idea of entities, which is the idea of self, of things having self, like I have a self, even a cup, the idea that a cup is a cup, that it exists, and those views are wrong. So a cup doesn't exist in science. I mean, we know this from modern science even. I mean, we didn't need a modern science for it, but modern science will tell you that even the atoms and the molecules don't exist per se. It's more complicated than that. It's more unstable than that. But uh, it's also much more simpler from a Buddhist perspective is that the cup is just not a thing that can exist. So it's that kind of existence, the existence of a self or an entity. As for non-existence, the idea that well, the commentary actually says it differently, right? They say it's related to annihilation at the moment of death. But I think that's just a part of this, is the idea of nothing being real was very common in, in the Buddhist time. Maya, this is all just illusion, and it doesn't actually exist. Because something uh, something is real. And so if you just say that this is all illusion, and it's not like there is nothing, or nothing is is nothing is real. That's also wrong. What's right is that experience is real. Moments of experience. Bhante, it's problematic if you um, reuse the word like God, for example, and there are many different other words. Would it make sense to just reuse it like what the Buddha did with the word? Um, I'm not sure which one it was. I don't think or it's very it... useful to reuse the word God. I think it's more useful to deny it, but useful in the sense of talking to people who believe in God. It could be yes. considered valuable. Well, there are ways, I think, of I would, I would prefer to skirt around the, the topic and try and find common ground without actually reaffirming the existence of God. Because you don't want to give the wrong idea and make people complacent. On the other hand, you don't want to alienate people because of their beliefs you know, to try and uh, help them to let go of their beliefs. It's not easy. I mean, I would say people who have strong belief in God are going to have a real time with meditation practice. This makes them too complacent and too blind, unable and uninterested in seeing the truth. Is there a, an age limit up to which uh, there is no chance for for a person to start meditating or to uh, let go of their belief, like for instance, to believe in a god, or there is n not such a limit? No. Okay, thank the you. Age is not real. It's just just a number. And then there's the uh, the other way. Because, but it's not exactly because of the number, it's because of the development. Children are undeveloped. So there's the doctrine that below a certain age they're unable. But you might argue that different children even develop at different rates. So couldn't really put a number on it that either, I don't think. Maybe you could. All right, that's all for me this week. Thank you all for coming. Have a good week. Sadhu, 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 sadhu